Uh, thank you very much for coming to my talk. Uh, okay. uh, my name is Joshua Louis. I come from uh, the department in this school. And today I would like to tell you some of our recent research about the observation of very exclusive block Ziga shift in monolayer tungsten disulfide. So I will explain what block Ziga shift, what very exclusive means in this talk. So to begin with, I would like to give a short introduction on two-dimensional materials. Uh, probably many of you have heard of the development of 2D materials. So these are three uh, well-known examples of 2D materials in their bulk form. Uh, we have graphite, uh, boron nitride, and molybdenum disulfide, or we call it MOS2. So they are very different in appearance in their bulk form. Uh, and graphite is a semi-metal, Brown nitride is an insulator, and molybdenum disulfide is, an, is a semiconductor. So although they are very different in their appearance, they all share the same uh, layer structure if you zoom in to see the atoms. So the atoms are bonded strongly within the same layers. But the layers are coupled weakly by van der Waal interactions in these materials. So therefore, the layers can slide along each other very well, uh, so you can find this commercial product, that these materials are very good lubricants. Uh, but for us, uh, it has more profound meaning uh, besides being lubricants, uh, because we can exfoliate one monolayer of this material and study their electronic properties. So in the monolayer form, we call uh, the, the graphite a piece of graphene. And graphene is a semi-metal with a direct cone electronic band structure. And brown nitride monolayer is still an insulator with a band gap of about 6 eV. And MOS2 in the monolayer form has a direct gap in contrast to the indirect gap in the bulk form. And the band gap is about 2 eV. It is a semiconductor. So besides these three materials, there is actually a whole family of two-dimensional materials which are being rapidly developed in recent years. Besides graphene and brown nitride, which are well known, we also have a large family of transition metal dichalcogenide, or we call them TMD materials, including MOS2, MOSE2, WS2, WSE2, and many, many other combinations. And recently, uh, we, uh, people also study black phosphorus, which is also a layer material, and you can peel it into a single layer as well. So all these 2D materials share many uh, great properties. For example, they're mechanically stable, strong, and they're quite flexible. You can stretch them for a few percent without breaking them. And some of the materials has very high mobility. For example, in graphene, uh, graphene has the highest mobility of all materials at room temperature. Uh, you can actually even see the quantum Hall effect at room temperature for graphene. And this family of 2D materials has a, a, a lot of uh, applications in electronics. So let me give you an example on uh, transistors. Uh, this is the first transistor made by Bell Lab about half a century ago. Uh, this is the modern version of the transistor made by Intel. So although these two transistors are very different in appearance and in scale, uh, they're both made by metal, by insulator, and semiconductors. And for 2D materials, we have all of these combinations ready. So in principle, we can build the whole circuit uh, just by 2D materials. So nowadays, the silicon technology is kind of approaching a limit. And 2D materials open a new pathway to, to do a nanotechnology. And besides that, 2D materials cover a wide range of band gap. So here, I plot the band gap of different 2D materials. In graphene, we can uh, turn the gap size of graphene from 0 to about 200 milli eV. And then from about 300 milli eV, uh, black phosphorus will take over all the way to the visible range. And you can control the band gap size by changing the thickness of the materials. And the family of transition metal dichalcogen I will cover from 1 eV to about 2.5 eV. And you can change the atomic composition, the strain, and the composition uh, to, to tune the, the gap size of the material. Then in the UV range, we have uh, brown nitride. So this wide range of band gap huh, will make this material very useful for many applications. So one central uh, research theme in 2D material is that how can we manipulate the energy state of the material? 
That means, okay, I have a material with a certain gap size. Can I do something so that the size of the band gap will be different? And I can do it controllably. That means I press the button. I have this gap size. I press another button. I have this gap size. So this is one central topic in our research, is to manipulate the, the size of the energy, uh, the band gap in the material. Uh, so there have been a lot of progress in the past decade. So when I was a student uh, at Columbia, we spent much time to uh, use the electric field effect to tune the size of the band gap in a graphene. Um, for example, in bilayer graphene, there's no band gap. Huh? The conduction band and valence band touch each other. And this degeneracy is because of the inversion symmetry of the crystal. Huh? So the, the atoms, they're related. The two layers are related to each other by inversion symmetry. But if you apply an electric field, that is, you build an electrostatic gating and apply the electric field, then you can break the symmetry and leave the degeneracy here. Then the band gap will be open. Huh? The band gap will be open. Uh, so this is the result uh, I got when I was a student about seven or eight years ago. Uh, we studied bilayer graphene. So the red curve here is the band structure of bilayer graphene in the pristine form. So if you apply an electric field by, in by injecting the electrons into the material, then the Fermi level will raise, then the internal electric field generated by the gating will also open the band gap in the material. So the initial interband transition here will be separated into two transitions, A and B here. Okay? Then we measure the electronic transition by using infrared absorption spectroscopy. So we see the transition peak of the pristine sample. Then we gauge the sample. We see the transition peak is broken into two separated peaks. So the separation of these two peaks corresponds to the size of the gap. So we measure that the gap size can turn all the way from zero to about 200 milliEV. And similar results are also obtained by other groups. Uh, then uh, this is the most recent result on band gap opening uh, by using the electric field effect. Uh, this is obtained a few months ago, uh, published uh, in Science. So this is the absorption spectrum of bilayer graphene. Uh, so they use ultra-clean bilayer graphene sample encapsulated by brown nitride. So by applying the electric field, they can open the gap, then they can see the, the band gap transition. Uh, you can see this is much sharper than our than our previous data, okay? So this is, shows the rapid development of 2D materials. They make huge progress. And they can even see the excitonic transition and very well tunable uh, by using the electric field effect. Okay, the second method, uh, besides the electric field effect, is by using strict. Uh, you, you can put the 2D material on a flexible substrate. Then you can bend the substrate so that the 2D material will be stretched. Uh, because it is only one monolayer, so it's very easy to stretch it. Uh, by stretching the material, you can also change the size of the band gap. Uh, and the effect can be quite uh, noticeable. Uh, let me uh, show you an example. This is the absorption spectrum of uh, black phosphorus uh, uh, fuel layer. So the black line is the absorption peak uh, when there's no string. So you see two peaks, they correspond to the electron the excitonic transition in, across the band gap. So you apply a little bit string. Uh, this is the string. It's less than 1% of the string. You apply a little bit string, then it shifts uh, for quite, quite a lot, actually. Okay? So string is another knot that you can use to tune the band gap size in the material. So these are two examples uh, that we can tune the band gap. And there are actually some limitations on this method, although they're very powerful. First, you need electrical or mechanical contact. Uh, that means you have to physically touch the sample okay, in order to change it. And because you have to physically touch it, uh, the, the switching speed is usually slow. Uh, for a mechanical method, you take at least a few seconds to bend it. Okay? And for electrical uh, method, you need nanoseconds time scale to, to change it. Okay? It's relatively slow. So now the question is, can we manipulate the energy state by using purely optical method? That means I shine the light on it, I have the band gap become bigger. I turn off my light, the band gap becomes smaller. So this is what we are interested in doing. So there are a few advantages in this method. First, 
it is a non-contact manipulation. That means I don't need to physically touch my sample. I simply shine the light, okay? Shining light is not considered as physical touch, okay, in our case. Uh, another advantage is that it can be turned on very fast. So in our lab, we can produce a pulse of about 100 femtosecond. A femtosecond is 10 to the negative 15 second. So within this pulse duration, I can turn on and make the band gap larger, and turn it off and make the band gap smaller. So the speed is much faster, a thousand or 10,000 times faster than the electrical case. And the third advantage is that we can make use of some novel optical selection rules uh, to selectively tune one part of the band structure and not the other part. And this is related to the very degree of freedom uh, that I will talk about uh, in this talk. So to begin with, uh, let me tell you some uh, basic principle of how we can use light to change the energy level. So let's consider two, a, a simple two-level system, A and B, uh, very simple. Let's suppose there's no interaction between A and B. Then you have A and B. Okay, then now let's turn on some interaction between A and B. So this interaction, we usually mix the two state, and you have to uh, re-diagonalize the Hamiltonian, and the net result is that you, the renormalized state will have a larger energy separation. So this is what we call the level repulsion, or the state repulsion. And the level repulsion always happens unless you have some symmetry in the crystal that, that uh, suppress the interaction. So now we can use light to turn on such an interaction. So let's consider the case of a, a one band. Okay, this is one electronic band in a material. Then we shine some light on it. And we shine some coherent light. And this laser will interact with the electrons and they will mix together to generate some photon stress state. So the photon stress state is the same as the original electronic band, but it shifts up and down. And you can have many of them. Uh, above it and many of them below it, okay? And the separation between the levels are the photon energy, okay? This is called a photon dress state or we call it the flow K state. So this has been observed uh, by New Gaddix group at MIT. So I was a postdoc uh, at MIT in New Gaddix group before. So when they discovered this effect, I was, I was there to witness the process. So this is the RPES data of the surface state of bismuth selenide. Uh, bismuth selenide is a topological insulator with a surface state, and it is a, a direct cone. Then we shine a strong infrared pulse onto the surface. Then we find that the infrared pulse will actually interact with the electrons. And then you can see the generation of all this photon dress state. It happened above and below the original direct cone. Okay, you can also mix with the original band and open the band gap. There are many, many fancy effects. But the main point here is once you shine the light on the material, you generate a photon dress state. And they're equally spaced both up and down. So now let's consider the two level system again. Then we shine some light. Then we tune the photon energy to be slightly less than the band gap of this material so that you can generate a photon dress state just right below the, the B state. Then this photon dress state will interact with the B state. And uh, the interaction depends on the energy separation between them. Uh, this energy separation is the E, uh, the band gap minus H bar omega. This is called the detuning energy. Then these two levels will repel with each other. Yeah. Then you have the same uh, uh, process. You, you generate the photon dress state of the B state that is very close to the A state, and then these two will also interact with each other. Then you, you push the level down. So the net result is that the A and B state will mix with the photon state, and then uh, they will become wide, wider, okay? Uh, the delta E is the energy shift between A and B. So there's a simple formula for the change of energy. And that is the change of energy is proportional to I, which is the laser intensity, and the detuning energy, uh, the band gap minus h bar omega. So this event has a name, and uh, this is called optical star shift. Uh, optical star shift. So we can actually realize this 
in 2D materials. Uh, in 2D materials, usually we have a whole electronic band, uh, so the two-level system may not be applicable. But there is some interesting effect in 2D material that make the two-level system quite applicable in our case. So for uh, 2D materials, you can generate electron and holes in the conduction band and valence band. And, and in conventional material, they're just free particles. But for 2D materials, the electrons and holes, they interact strongly with each other. So if you solve a hydrogen atom in two dimension, you'll find that the binding energy is four times larger than in the three-dimensional case. Uh, because when you can find the charges, they see each other more often, so they interact more often. And when you reduce the system into one monolayer, then you have less material. So the dielectric screening is much weaker. So this causes the electron and hole to strongly bond it to each other. So they are not free particles, but they form the exciton. So you can describe the exciton by a two-level system. Uh, the ground state is the A state. That means there's no exciton. The excited state is the B state with one exciton. So you can use a two-level system to describe the exciton. And we have measured the absorption spectrum of the exciton in a monolayer tungsten disulfide. And we see a very well-defined absorption peak for the exciton. Okay? So it's quite sharp. So the two-level system is a good description. OK, then we uh, want to see how we can shift the exciton uh, uh, energy gap. Then we pump the sample with a strong light. Then we probe the, the absorption with a broadband white light pulse. OK, that means you pump it, you shift it, and then you measure the absorption. So, we, okay. so this is a schematic of our setup. We pump our sample and shift the energy level. Then we probe the sample with a white light pulse. And then we send the light into the grating, into the spectrometer, and see the change of the absorption spectrum. Uh, so we are, we are pumping it here. Not at the resonance, but a little bit below the resonance. Yeah. Then the, the exit time peak will be shifted up. Okay? Then in our technique, we can measure the difference of the absorption spectrum. That means the pump-induced uh, spectrum minus the original absorption spectrum. So the data will look, look like this. Uh, this is the red curve minus the black curve. So you have the oscillation here. So from this oscillation data, we can extract the energy shift. Okay, we can extract the energy shift. And this is the optical star shift. And we have measured the optical star shift as a function of pump pump delay. That means you pump it, then you prop it. We find that we see the signal only when the pump and prop pulses overlap exactly with each other. If they are slightly separated, then the heat effect is killed. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a coherent interaction effect between light and electrons. So these are the data that we measure. Uh, the dots represent the energy shift, and the different color represent different photon energy. And we plot it as a function of pump fluence. So you can see the linear dependence because the optical star shift depends on the light intensity and over the detuning energy. And we can also replot the data as a function of pump fluence over detuning energy. Then all this data point will lie in one line and show a very good linear dependence. So this is the proof that this is an optical star shift. And I want to draw your attention to the number. This is about 18 milliEV. So this number may not be uh, may not sound like uh, excellent for you, but it is a very big shift for us. So uh, people have already observed optical star shift in uh, gallium masna in those uh, conventional semiconductors, but the shift is very small. It's about 1 milliEV. Uh, and you have to cool down your sample to a few Kelvin to see the effect. So what we observe is 10 times larger. And we can do it, we can observe it at room temperature. Okay, so it has a direct technological relevance. Because we can see this at room temperature. And another uh, important property of the optical star shift in monolayer tungsten disulfide is we can uh, selectively change the energy state in one of the valleys. So this is the first brilliant zone of monolayer tungsten disulfide. It is a hexagon, just like graphene. So at the corner of the hexagon, we have the conduction band and the valence band. They form a direct band gap. So they are totally six valleys. But only two of the six valleys are inequivalent to each other. And we call them the k-valley and the k-prime valley. 
the k and k prime value are connected to each other by time reversal symmetry. Okay, so uh, um, they're opposite to each other in spin. Huh? For the valence band, uh, there are two valence bands. Huh? They are they are separated by the spin orbit coupling huh? in this material. Then, uh, because of their different uh, property, they are coupled to different light helicity. For example, if you shine uh, left-handed circular polarized light, then we can generate excitons in the K valley. If we shine the left-handed circular polarized light, then we can generate exciton in the K prime valley. So these two valleys are coupled to different light polarization. Okay? So we can use light to control the valley. So we have carried out a, a measurement of optical star shift by using circularly polarized light to drive the system. Okay? So this is the data under left-handed circular polarization, and this is in K Valley. So uh, uh, let's uh, look closely into uh, the physics inside. Okay? So this is the, the band structure in one valley, okay? only in the K Valley. The black lines are the conduction band and valence band before the pumping. So you can see this number, negative 1 half, negative 3 over half. This is the quantum number of the angular momentum of the electrons. Huh? There are different contributions, the spin, the orbital angular momentum. Uh, they all combine together. Then you have negative 1 over 2, negative 3 over 2 for the valence band and conduction band. So if you shine the left-handed circular polarized, polarized light, then you can generate a photon dress state. And uh, this sigma negative here, uh, this left-handed photon has an angular momentum of negative 1. Okay? So you sum over negative 1 here, you have negative 3 over 2. Then these two states have the same quantum number, so they can interact with each other. So you push the state up, push the state down, then you have the optical star shift. Okay? Then let's look at uh, the other value. The other value is the time reversal counterpart of the first value. So all the quantum number is the opposite. You have negative 3 over 2, here you have positive 3 over 2. Negative 1 half and positive 1 half. Then when you have the same left-handed photon here, then you have, neg you have a negative 1 here. So when you sum together, you have negative 1 over 2. Then these two quantum numbers are not the same. So they won't interact with each other. So there's no optical star shift in the K prime valley. So by using circular polarized light, we can selectively only change the energy state of one valley, not the other. Okay. Then uh, how about you use right-handed circular polarized light? For the right-handed circular polarized light, the photon has plus one quantum number. So one over half plus one is with one half. Then these two are different. These two numbers are different, so there's no interaction. But for the k prime value, when you plus one here, then you have three over two. Then they are the same. Then you have the energy shift. So you shift the the the, the energy state in the k prime value. So that means when you use left-handed circular polarized light, you shift the k value. When you use right-handed circular polarized light, you shift the k prime value. So this is what we call the valley selective optical star shift. Um, so, as a summary, we observe a strong optical star shift in monolayer tungsten disulfide, about 80 mEV, and uh, the optical star shift shows valley selection. Huh? So, this work has been published two years ago uh, by both uh, Feng Wang's group in Berkeley and, and our group at MIT. Huh? So, it is quite a, a big discovery at that time. Okay, and. Uh, the focus of this, part, it, of this talk is not an optical star shift. It's on block Ziga shift. So I'm going to continue to see what we have discovered recently. So instead of using optical pulse, huh, we now use infrared pulse to pump the sample. So all the experimental setting is the same. The only difference is that now we change the driving photon energy. Okay? So we drive it way ab below the conduction band. So initially, we are pumping it here, and we see the shift. Now we use infrared light to pump it way below, and we want to see what happens. Uh, in principle, if you drive it hard enough, you will still see the shift. Okay. So let's uh, make a comparison. Uh, in the visible pumping, we are pumping it very 
like right below the, the band edge. Then we see the, the, the strip of the K valley, not the K prime valley. Uh, then now we're pumping it far away from the conduction band, okay? And we drive it very hard. And we can still see the shift in the K valley. But what we find interesting is that in this case, we also see the shift in the K prime valley. Both valleys are driven. And apparently, this K prime valley violates the valley selection rule. So there's something wrong going on. The valley selection rule is supposed to be quite strict, strict, but now it is violated. So we want to know why. Um, so we have done the measurement at different pump fluence. So these are the, the data at different fluences from 160 microjoule per centimeter square all the way to 800. And this is at one of the photo energy. Then we do it in another photo energy, all the fluences. Then we continue this at different photo energy. So we have a lot of data. Then from each of this line, we can extract the energy shift. Then we plot the energy shift as a function of fluence over detuning energy. So here, there are two sets of data. The solid symbol represents the shift in the K valley. The open symbols represent the shift at the K prime valley. So for the K valley, we see a very good linear dependence. Uh, then this is the signature of the optical star shift. But for the K prime valley, we find that the data just scattered around. Uh, you don't see a good linear dependence. Uh, the, so there's something different on the K prime valley. And we know that the K prime valley shift is not the optical star shift. Then we report, we report the data of the K prime valley on a different axis. In this case, we plot it as a function of fluence over band gap plus h bar omega. And we find that we recover this linear relationship. And there are two uh, observations here. First is this re linear relationship. Second is you find that the slope of this plot and the slope of this plot are exactly the same. Okay, they share the same y-axis. So that means these two kinds of shift, they share the same underlying mechanism, but with different energy dependence. So for this one, is band gap minus h bar omega. For the other one, is band gap plus h bar omega. Okay, so we have a big hint to know what kind of shift this is. So let's summarize our observation. Uh, we find that uh, when we drive the system, uh, we, we see the big shift in K prime valley, and the shift has opposite valley selection rules, and it has the energy dependence of one over band gap plus h bar omega. So now the big question is, what is this new type of shift? Uh, so here, I will introduce the block Ziga shift. It is actually quite, quite simple. So you still drive the two-level system with the light, but now, instead of inducing the original uh, photon dress state, we now we can consider a second set of photon dress state. Uh, because when you drive the system, in principle, you have all kind of photon dress state and going up and down, uh, like what I showed the, the RPS data. Okay, so now we can consider a different photon dress state. So this photon dress state will interact with the A state, and then this will push the A state down. In this case, the detuning energy is no longer band gap minus h bar omega, but band gap plus h bar omega. Okay. Then similarly, you can generate another photon dress state here, and then this state will interact with the B state, and this will push the B state up. Okay. The net result is that you also make the band gap wider. But the shift of this uh, band gap is proportional to the fluence over band gap plus h bar omega. So this kind of shift is called the block Ziga shift. Okay. Uh, people have actually observed the block Ziga shift in atomic physics, like in co atom. Uh, when you shine the light and drive the energy shift, the dominant effect is the optical star shift. But there is always a small correction, and this correction is the block Ziga shift. So let's make a comparison. Uh, for optical star shift, you generate the photon dress state within the band gap. Then you drive the band gap to be wider. Then it is proportional, the intensity over band gap minus h bar omega. But for block Ziga shift, 
you drive the photon drag state outside the band gap. And uh, the energy shift is proportional to intensity over band gap plus h bar omega. So these two processes, they are related to each other by the time reversal uh, symmetry. In this case, let's say at the A state, it absorbs the photon to have the flow K state. But in this case, it emits the photon. So one is absorption process, the other is the emission process. So they are related to each other by time reversal process. Okay. So the ratio between the block zika shift and optical star shift is related to uh, their, their detuning energy. Uh, it's E uh, band gap minus h bar omega over band gap plus h bar omega. So from this formula, you can see that when the h bar when the h bar omega is very close to the band gap then the optical star shift will dominate, and the block zika shift will be very small. But when the photon energy is small, let's say uh, one half or one third of the band gap, then the two effects will be comparable. Huh? So this is what we observe in our experiment, and it, it follows very well with the prediction. So let's consider the valley selection rules, huh? because block zika shift and optical star shift are time reversal counterpart with each other. And the two values, k and k prime values, are also time reversal counterpart with each other. So we expect a different value selection rules. So let's consider the block zika shift. Uh, we have talked about this, but let's briefly review it. Uh, so in this case, let's consider the k value. You have one half, uh, neg negative one half, negative three half. Then you absorb a left-handed photon. You have negative three half. So these two will interact and repel the state. But for the k prime value, uh, when you have the same process, uh, the quantum number will not match, so they will not interact with each other. But for the Brock Zika shift, you have the same quantum number for the k and k prime state. But now, in this case, you are not absorbing, uh, in this case, it's absorbing the photon. But in the Brock Zika shift, you are emitting the photon. So in this case, you, you have minus one. In this case, you have plus one, uh, because it's the time reversal process. So the negative one half will become plus one half. So the plus one half and the negative three half here, they don't match each other, so there's no interaction. But in this case, uh, the one half plus one will become three, three half. So the three half will match the three half in the conduction band, so they will interact with each other. So what cannot happen in the K prime value for optical star shift? It becomes possible for the block zika shift, and they complement with each other. So now we can separate the two, uh, the two effects. To make, we can confine the optical star shift to happen in k valley, and then the block zika shift to happen in the k prime valley. So this is a, a summary. Uh, we have two valleys connected by time reversal symmetry, and the two shifts connected also by time reversal symmetry. So once we use circular polarized light, we can break the time reversal symmetry, so that one valley uh, one shift happening in one valley, the other shift happening in another valley. Huh. So this is what we call the valley exclusive block zika shift. Uh, our discovery has three uh, significances. Huh. So let me uh, uh, show them one by one. Uh, first, this is the first observation of block zika shift in a condensed matter system. Uh, Brock zika shift has been observed in atomic physics, in co-atom. Uh, usually in co-atom, in order to trap the atom, you, you shine a continuous laser and shift the energy up so that you can generate potential well by the electric field uh, intensity. Then you can trap the co-atom. So the major uh, effect is the optical star shift. Uh, the Brock zika shift is a small correction. Uh, but for condensed matter, uh, the Brock zika shift is very small. It's very difficult to see. So, so this is the first time we can see it in uh, a condensed matter system. Second, uh, the shift that we see is about 10 milli EV. Uh, it is not very large, but it is already a thousand times bigger than the previous record. Huh. In the atomic physics, they use continuous laser. Uh, what they want is not high intensity. What they want is the precision. Okay. So the shift they get is about 10 micro EV. Uh, that is enough to trap the, the, trap the co-atom. Huh? But in our case, we use pulse laser. Uh, the electric field is orders of magnitude higher. So we can see a, uh, we can see a much bigger shift. Huh? 
And the third significance is that uh, this is the first time that we can completely separate the block Zika shift from the optical star shift. In atomic physics, both effects happen together. So you, you see the big part from the optical star shift and a very small correction from the, the block Zika shift uh, because there's no values in the atomic, in the atomic system. Uh, but in 2D materials, uh, we can use the values to separate the two effects. So in atomic physics, uh, this two effect looks like a, a first order and second order process. Uh, you have the major optical star shift and the small correction due to block Zika shift. But indeed, both effects are first order process. Okay? Uh, it's not second order or first order. Both are first order process. Uh, but they are just mixed, they just mixed together. So in our case, we can separate them. Uh, and actually, we can show that both effects have similar magnitude. They're comparable. Uh, when you pump in a right wave, they, they, they are almost the same size. Uh, uh, so this is the, the first complete separation using the valley physics. Uh, so uh, this project is still going on in our lab uh, at UC Riverside. Uh, so uh, uh, if some of the students are interested, uh, we can talk about this. Uh, so uh, let me give you one example that we are working on now. Uh, so there's a great potential in this project uh, because Nobody have observed block Zika shift in condensed matter yet. Uh, and we see it, and uh, we are supposed to do many interesting things on this effect. So one of the effects that we are looking for is the nonlinear optical star shift. So for example, we, if we use infrared light to drive the system, we can actually generate a two-photon dress state. Like you, have, you uh, absorb two photon, okay? Then the detuning energy will be bang at minus two photon energy and you can also have the energy shift. But then the, uh, the, de the dependence will be very different. Uh, first, this is a truly second order process. So it will depend on intensity squared. Okay? And uh, the detuning energy is also different. So we can use the quadratic relationship to separate this effect. And the second feature is that when you absorb two photon, the angular momentum is going to be very different for, this, for the state. So the value selection rule will be different. You are not going to drive the same value anymore. You are going to drive the opposite value by using the second order optical star shift. And you can continue to have the third order, fourth order optical star shift, and then the value selection will alternate. When you have one more photon, you go to this value. You add one more photon, you go back to this value. Okay? And uh, uh, these are all well predicted. And something similar will also happen in the block Zika shift. So one remark I want to make is that you cannot see this in atoms, okay? In atoms, it's not possible to see the second order optical star shift because in atom, the two level has fixed angular momentum, has fixed angular momentum. Once you add one more atom, you mismatch the angular momentum, they are not going to interact with each other, okay? But in 2D material, the angular momentum is actually not a strict quantum number. It is actually the module of three. Like when you have, like the, the crystal has a three-fold rotational symmetry. So once you have more and more, you have to go back. You have to cut down by number three, cut down by number three. So when you keep going on, you always, the two values always have one of them matching your condition. So you just al keep alternating. So you can see the higher order process. So this opened a window to see higher order energy shift um, um, in 2D materials. Okay. So uh, uh, to end the talk, I would like to acknowledge my collaborator, uh, particularly Epperson. Uh, he was a graduate student at MIT when I was there a few years ago. So he's now a postdoc at Stanford. And Neil Gedek, uh, he's my former advisor at MIT. Uh, the samples are provided by Yi San Li and Jin Kong. And thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and what were you saying about the two photon thing? You have two cases, right? You have plus two, and 
Uh, when you have, yeah, when you use linear polarized, like you, you drive both value, then there's no value selection. When you use one polarization and change the angle and change the photon number, then you can alternate the value selection. Then you have plus two. Plus two equal to plus two equal to negative one because it's module three. Oh, we don't consider the high energy level. We only consider one exciton state. Huh. Yeah. Oh, okay. In the simple model, we just consider one exciton. There are multiple exciton species in the material that, that makes the whole thing very complicated. But the good thing about tungsten disulfide is that the other excitons are well separated. So and they, even if you all yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, their contribution will be small. Uh, it would be interesting if we can see other exciton contribution. Oh, that's a good. Uh, uh, oh yeah, uh, these are all done by the probe light. Uh, wait. Okay, let's see. It. So this is our setup. So you can see uh, we can control the pump polarization to be left or right-handed polarization. Then this will drive different value. Then for the probe light, the probe light is a, a wide light pulse, a broadband wide light pulse. We can also control the polarization of the wide light pulse to be left or right-handed. So, so this control which value to probe. So you can selectively pump van value and probe either of the valleys. Huh. Uh, the, the optical star shift theory has been there for a long time. Yeah, so we just pick up the old theory to explain it. But the valley selection is something new, but it's not difficult to add it. Uh, for the block Ziga shift, the theory has also been there for a long time. It's uh, one part of the, the quantum optics. So we also use the old theory. Uh, the, the only addition is the value selection. Uh, for different materials, uh, the, the, the light electron interaction strength will be different. So uh, we can see a big shift, like 20 milli EV. The main reason is because for 2D materials, the light matter interaction is very strong. For example, for monolayer tungsten disulfide, this absorption peak is about 20%. Like one, one layer of atom absorbs 20% of the light. So that is a lot. So this is the main reason why the, the shift is so large. Uh, yes, in principle, yes, but our method could not probe that. Well, I mean, you could do it in a lot more than one are, are the numbers in the, the light signs sufficient that you could actually have a measurable current in one direction or another? No, in this case, there's no, in this case, there's no electronic excitation. We're, we're driving the system below the band gap, so there's no real excitation. Like, you did not add the, the uh, electrons. So yeah, yeah, the conduction band is manipulated, but there's no electron population on the conduction band. Uh, this is one reason why we can drive the system so hard. Yeah. Usually, if there is absorption, you pump it, you burn it. Okay, the 2D material is very fragile. It, it, like, although we are not like a non-contact method, but you can destroy it with a non-contact method. One pulse, you burn a hole. But a good thing about this is you are not pumping it 
at the resonance. You're, com you're pumping it below the resonance. So you, there's no absorption. You, you can drive it very hard, change the state, but the sample is sta still uh, stable. We, we actually do all, did all the experiment at room temperature in ambient condition. And the sample is OK. Uh, so this is what is like, very appealing for us. Uh, any other questions? 